Hey y'all, Chelsea and Danny here. Enjoy this episode of Today's Homeowner here on YouTube. These homeowners wanted a nice, comfortable den with lots of natural wood. We've delivered it. We'll show you how. Today's Homeowner with Danny Lipford. Real projects for real homeowners with real solutions. Information and inspiration on improving your home from professional remodeler Danny Lipford. Well, I'm glad you're with us this week. You know, families are spending more and more time around their home these days, so it only makes sense an addition like this will become very popular, and it really has. This is a family room or den addition that we're building on the rear of this older home. Now, this particular one is 22 feet by 30 feet, plenty of room for those nice informal family gatherings. Now this room, when it's complete, will have a real masculine feel to it. A real masonry fireplace, hardwood floor, a very nice turtleback ceiling with wood over the entire surface. Now this will be a good looking project for you to follow along and you'll see it all in this week's show. Welcome back to the show. You can really get an idea of how large this room will be now that we have a few of the walls up. It's actually adding over 600 square feet to the existing house. Now the foundation for this addition is what we call a floating slab. It's actually three to four inches of concrete sitting on top of compacted fill. And we were able to do that by building a foundation wall all the way around the perimeter of this area with concrete footing, then our block mason, then we came back in with more clay, more compaction, and our concrete finisher gave us a nice smooth finish over the entire slab. Now, this is concrete, but the actual foundation of the original house is a wood floor system supported by piers. The wood floor system was built using 2 by 10 floor joist and 3 quarter inch subfloor supported by brick piers that are sitting on concrete footings. Now the reason we didn't carry the same wood floor system out into the new area is because of the grade here in the back is really too low for a wood floor system. It just wouldn't pass the building code and really just too close to the ground. So the slab will work out great, but what we wanted to make sure of is that the finished floor in this room will match the finished floor in the existing house because most of this wall will be removed later in the project. Now in order to figure out exactly where the top of this slab needed to be in relation to the inside floor, we created just a real simple drawing out on the job. Now you can see that this is the concrete slab that I'm standing on, and this is the top edge of the concrete. On top of it, we'll be installing three quarter inch plywood, then three quarter inch hardwood on top of that. Now the reason we're putting the three quarter inch plywood is to give us an area to nail into um, all of the hardwood flooring. Now there, there is three eighths inch glue down hardwood that's available, but the homeowners wanted a special type of wood that's not available in the glue down type. Now, on the existing subfloor, we have the 2x10s that I mentioned earlier. We have our 3 quarter inch subfloor nailed to the top of that. So our slab that we're standing on is actually a half inch lower than the existing subfloor inside. But in the finished stages, we're going to install the cement board, a little adhesive, and ceramic tile on top. So keeping the slab a half inch lower, we'll make sure, we'll make sure that everything works out right in the finish of the job. Now, let's take a look at a little bit of the framing taking place. The small interior walls are put together on the floor and then set in place on top of the base plates, which were installed ahead of time to define the layout of the rooms. Now, if the layout man is measured accurately, these walls just have to be leveled and nailed to the base plate and the adjoining walls. Now, once the walls are secure, the crew starts creating the framework for our ceiling. Three 2x12s with plywood create the beams that will form the perimeter of the raised turtleback ceiling. Now this has to go in before the roof rafters are put in place. Now the roof rafters are a project in themselves. Now these rafters span almost 40 feet from the outside wall to near the ridge of the existing house. Now they're actually two by eights, 20 feet long, mated together with plywood splints. Now this makes moving them into place quite a chore and with about 24 of them to install, it was a big job. After our roof rafters were in place, it was time for our roof decking, and it took over 50 sheets of plywood to cover this large roof. After that, our 15-pound building felt was installed, and then a little bit of more work on our fascia and soffit, and we're ready for our roofer. Now, there's still quite a bit of framing to be done on the inside. 
Now one of the things the framers had to make sure they really took care of here on the inside of the addition is the support of our long roof span. You can see they have blocking on the top of this beam that will be the, one of the perimeter beams for our turtleback ceiling to support it at that point. Then at about the halfway span, we have a two by four wall with two by six purling that'll not only support that roof well, but also keep it nice and straight for many years to come. Now one of the biggest changes in this area is the removal of the original back wall of the house. If you remember just a little while ago in the segment, we had a piece of plywood here with a drawing on it all of that's been removed, all of the stud work, and we installed a double LVL beam or laminated veneer lumber beam to support all of our ceiling joist, our support wall, and some second story load that is created by the ceiling joist that also serve as floor joist. Now one of the things the framers are saving for a rainy day is all of the time consuming and intricate work that's involved in the final framing of the turtleback ceiling. We'll see that and a lot of other things when we come back. Stay with us. Get ready to review your fix-it list as Danny and home repair expert Joe Trawini show you this week's simple solution. Brought to you by DuPont Tyvek. Build it once, build it right. Central air conditioning is one of the most efficient ways to cool your home, but it does require a little bit of maintenance. You're right, Danny. There's not much you need to do, but every home's central air conditioning unit has a drain line like this that runs from the condenser coils inside the house to the exterior. The problem is mold and mildew can grow inside the pipe and it'll eventually form a clog so that the water can't drain out. Well, that'll cause a lot of problems too. I've seen over the years with water backing into the house, causing stained ceilings, damaged floors. Right. Now, I usually recommend taking a cup of bleach, mm -hmm. pouring it into the access hole for the drain line during the early spring. That'll usually take care of it. Yeah, the bleach will kill the mold and mildew, but in this case, the clog's already formed, so the, the bleach won't help much. But what I've found that works really well to remove the clog is take a wet dry vacuum like we have here, remove the paper or cloth filter so it doesn't get ruined, then just hold the hose, the vacuum hose, against the end of the pipe, and you can put duct tape around it, but this works just as well. Just get a cloth and wrap it around a couple of times and hold it really tightly. Then do me a favor, just turn that on okay. for a few seconds. That's, that's usually all you need, just five or six seconds, and that'll pull the clog out of the pipe and leave the line clear. Okay, after you've done that and unclogged, it's probably then a good time to use right. the bleach trick. Yeah, once it, the clog is removed, then every spring add a cup of bleach and that'll keep the mold and mildew from forming. And then you won't have to use this tip anymore. You won't, no. <laughs> well, it's obvious what's taking place now. Our drywall has finally been installed, both on the ceiling as well as the walls. Our insulation contractor, electrician, plumber, Alarm company all completed their work and our inspections are complete as well. But now the real focal point of this large room is our masonry fireplace. And the man who's responsible to make sure that it really works right is Ron Yui. Ron, we never get a chance to really see a masonry fireplace like this very much. Uh, kind of tell us how you got started on this one. All right, well this, because there was a slab already there, we had to keep this at a low grade, so I started out with a thin set, a thin set base. Okay. Then grouted this, and then come up with the with the side walls on this. And these are all fire brick. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. What about the mortar? Any special mortar on that? No, this is a regular uh, S type mortar with sand. Okay. Okay. Now I know that one of the biggest problems you can have with a fireplace if it just doesn't draw properly, and I guess this is the point where that's really determined whether it's going to work or not. Right. The. Uh, the thing you, that you want most in a fireplace is a continuous flow. You don't want any stall. So at this point, I'll be building a smoke chamber on top of this, and that will, that will equal the volume of this firebox. I see. And then from that step, you go to a flue size that accommodates the same cubic inches. I got you. Okay, now, I see you have some forming work taking place right here. What exactly are you um, doing in order to create right here? What are you trying to create? Okay, what I'm trying to do here is to get this flare to match the wings, so when you do have a fire in this, it projects the heat in all directions, okay. instead of containing it in a, in a, uh, a normal fireplace inside. So this will project it out. Okay, all right, what about the other bricks that will um, go around on the outside? Will you actually fill it solid in the voids that we have behind it here? Right, I'll, I'll build a, a, a structure on the outside of this. This I don't want to be load-bearing. Right. I want okay. this to be freestanding. Uh, for one one reason is it expands when it heats up. Okay. 
Okay. So I'll leave an airspace in here, and to carry the weight of the smoke chamber and the chimney, there'll be a, an outer structure, and the chimney will rest on a 12-inch wall that's out and back. Oh, okay. All right, now what about the traditional cast iron damper that normally fits on these? I guess that will be positioned at some point. Exactly. This will be our finished opening when we wrap it in stone. Okay. And then I'll come a minimum of eight inches above this height right here, so we have an area for the smoke to be drawn in, in case there is a downdraft. So you're talking about a lot of bricks to be laid? Yes. Now, it took a while to complete all of the work on the brickwork around the fireplace, but it's just what the homeowners wanted, a nice, old-fashioned masonry fireplace with plenty of room for logs. And with an expert like Ron taking care of the brickwork, we know it's going to work properly. Now, we have it covered up with plastic while our drywall finisher is completing all of the finishing and the painter will be on the job before long. And the drywall is all complete as far as the installation of it and a little bit of finishing is still left to be done there. Also, our trim carpenters have moved into this room and in the process of creating some real nice decorative panels over each of the three doors we have here on the back wall. That'll be a great look. Now, something else that'll take a fair amount of time is the installation of the beaded board that's going up on the upper part of the turtleback ceiling. You can see a couple of the pieces that we have in place just to get our angles right, but it should look really nice in this room as an accent there on the ceiling. Now, you know, beaded board is something that we use a lot on porch ceilings and a lot of accents on the outside of homes, and we're getting more and more requests to use it on the interior. And it's just simple one by four pine that's been milled with the tongue and groove and the bead, but makes a big difference in a room like this. Now, stay with us. When we come back, we'll show you the other pieces of the puzzle in this room. Now, let's join Danny at the Home Center to check out the best new products. Brought to you by The Home Depot. As a remodeling contractor, one problem I see homeowners having all the time when they're about to renovate their home, they can't remember what colors on the walls or the trim. Well, Rubbermaid's taking care of that with their paint journal. That's really a simple notebook that, great idea here, basically a history of your home, has a nice table of contents, and you're able to go right to a room that you may be renovating, like the kitchen. Behind that tab shows you the wall, ceilings, and trim, and gives you an opportunity to record the color, the brand of paint you used, how many gallons you used, date it purchased, everything you need. Even can put a little sampling of the paint itself with a little artist brush that's enclosed. You can dab a little paint there, you'll be able to see exactly what it looks like when you take this to the home center to buy your paint. Now, if you're dealing with wallpaper, it also helps you out there. You go to the back, and it has a little template that you can use to cut nice uniform samplings of the wallpaper, again, and then glue it right to the page. Now, some people have a little problem figuring out just exactly how much paint or wallpaper they need. Here's a paint coverage calculator that'll help you out there, and a wallpaper calculator that all you have to do is measure your walls figure up how much square footage, and this will convert it to exactly how many rolls you really need. So if you're looking for a nice housewarming gift, this may be just the thing. All of the structural work has been completed on this edition, and we're really getting into the finishing elements. And a lot of those elements consist of wood. Now, you remember at the last segment, we were in the process of trimming out the upper part of the doors, and you can see the end result are two nice panels over each double set of doors, and the crown molding tying in real nicely. Kind of elevates those doors right on up to the ceiling height. Also, our cabinet installer has been busy with the installation of cabinets, including the entertainment center you see behind me, the nice pocket type doors that tuck away, and then the TV swivel, real heavy duty, which is a good idea with a large room like we have here. Also at the other end of the room, he's completed installing the wet bar area and has a nice tile backsplash over it, kind of a focal point of the room. And over on this side, also more cabinetry to kind of balance out each side of the fireplace. Also, our stonemason, Ron, has been back on the job to take care of our cast limestone mantle that's basically a kit. has the two legs and the piece here, breast piece, and then right on top, uh, the mantle itself. So fairly easy to install, even though it is stone and very heavy, and all of the mortar really matches up nicely. 
Now you can tell these homeowners really like wood and if you look up at the beaded board ceiling you can really tell that pine is one of their favorites. Now this is a one by four bead board that runs all the way around. Hundreds of pieces were used to make up this ceiling and after the trim carpenters were complete. Then our painter came in with denatured alcohol to wipe down all of the wood to not only clean it but to really preserve the graining of the wood itself. Then two coats of sealer, it'll look like this for a long time. Now by now you're probably wondering what kind of floor we have under here and of course it's wood. And it's also a pine, but it's much different than the pine we have on the ceiling. In that the pine on the ceiling is uh, brand new, this could be up to 100 years old. Now what they've done is they've taken old timbers out from under demolished buildings and using a large bandsaw, ripped the wood down to what we have here. It's three quarter inch thick, it's tongue and groove, and it's about seven and a half inches wide. Fairly wide for an antique pine floor. Now this will really look nice once all the sanding's complete and that's the next step. Sanding is necessary to uniformly smooth out the surfaces of the boards. The flooring contractor uses a large belt sander to cover the wide open areas of the floor and a smaller disc sander to get into tight spots around walls and doorways. Now, these tools are very aggressive, so great care is taken so as not to scar the wood. Now, once this dusting process is complete, they move on to staining the floor. The owners and their decorator have chosen a slightly darker color than the other wood in the room to really emphasize the pine floor's grain and age. Now when the stain is dry, they apply several coats of clear polyurethane sealer to provide a tough finish to protect the floor. The result is a gorgeous floor that no doubt will receive a lot of attention once the homeowners move in. You know, it's always interesting to see how homeowners will decorate a room like this. Well, we'll see that next. Now let's go outside for Around the Yard. Lawn and garden tips you can use straight from the experts. Brought to you by TimberTech Engineered Decking Systems. Less work, more life. I'm with Dr. Trey Rogers, who's a turf expert. And Trey, I guess if you're going to have a nice looking lawn, you've got to deal with one of these things. Absolutely. This is our bread and butter. And the first thing I tell you is to treat this engine correctly by maintaining it annually. Change the oil, change the spark plug, change the air filter. Also, sharpen the mower blade. You start to mow with a dull blade, it's like shaving with a dull razor. Nothing good comes out of it. Yeah, that's no fun at all. And I also hear that you really need to mow very regular instead of letting the grass get too tall and then cutting it. Do it a lot more regular. Right, gotta have regular mowings. If, we, if you don't do that, we call that scalping. And that scalping will really be what causes a lot of weed encroachment. I see. So what we try to tell you to do is follow the one-third rule, which means you can use a ruler here and never cut more than a third of the leaf blade off during any single mowing. So if your target is to mow your yard at three inches, when it gets to four and a half inches, mow it back down to three. And that will keep the yard nice and thick for you. Also, try to mow, don't try to mow in the same pattern all the time. Think of a clock. Mow 12 to six one time, then three to nine after that, and then in diagonals. This is gonna help prevent soil compaction. Okay, that makes sense, all right. What about the clippings? Sometimes I see people with the bag to contain the clippings, and others I see mowing and just letting it go right back on the grass. What's the best? I say don't, I say leave the clippings on the ground. Okay. They don't contribute to thatch, and if you'll put these back on the ground, you'll save yourself one fertilization a year because they return valuable nutrients right back to the soil. Great. Additional support for today's homeowner with Danny Lipford, provided by Homelight. Simply Reliable, and Duck Brand Home Energy Efficiency Products. The homeowners have their furnishings in place, and this room is really taking on a great look. The true masonry fireplace that our brick mason created makes for a great focal point in the room, and the stone mantel really sets it off. The cabinets flanking the fireplace provide valuable storage space, as well as a great place to tuck away the television. On the opposite wall, matching cabinets and a unique ceramic backsplash create a beautiful wet bar. Warm wood tones were the theme for this room, from the custom wood turtleback ceiling to the beautifully finished heart pine floors. And outside, the addition blends in very well with the existing house. Plus, we've kept the den open to one of the most important rooms in the house, the kitchen. I hope you enjoyed this week's show and seeing this beautiful room come together. And I hope you'll come back and see us next week. I'm Danny Lifford. 
Hey, thanks for watching this episode of Today's Homeowner. And don't forget to comment, like, and hit the bell icon so that we can notify you when new videos are posted. And don't go anywhere. Click around and continue the home improving fun.